I'm so delighted to be here, and I'm so glad to see you all here. And I wonder if all of you share my feeling. That, do you feel the spirit of Francis Perkins here today? Do you feel the spirit of Francis Perkins here today? Yes. I know I do. Anyway, we have such a fabulous panel here. Um, I don't want to waste too much time with any introductions. I want to do point out that we have just an, a stellar panel, a stellar panel. We have Bill Luchtenberg, who really is the leading New Deal scholar in America. We have Charlie Wysanski, who worked in the Attorney General's office uh, for much of his career, and is now uh, working on a book on his father's history. His father, Judge Charles Wysanski, who many of you may know, was key in authoring much of the legislation that Francis Perkins is known for. And what was really most interesting is that after he left her, as uh, he'd been Solicitor General in the Labor Department, when he left her, he went to the Justice Department, where he defended the Social Security Act before the Supreme Court. And for those of us who know how very narrow some of those victories can be, you will be, uh, it, you will, you will especially appreciate uh, what a wonderful and resounding success that was. Um, next to him, we have Sam Elliott, a lifetime educator and who's also been very interested in following his father's work. His father wrote a very wonderful book called When the People Mattered. And it was a history of how his father was involved in writing the Social Security Act and then getting it passed by the House and the Senate, which was no easy matter. So I'd like to let them all speak for a few minutes. We'll have a little bit of conversation back and forth. And I want you all to be thinking of questions that you'd like to be asking, because it's a really unique opportunity to get three wonderful, fine, and thoughtful men who are experts on Social Security to talk to us a little bit about what they think it means today. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, the happiest memories of being here a year ago, and particularly of the uh, warm uh, reception that we had from uh, Tomlin and, and, and Christopher. And so I was delighted when Chris Bryce and uh, Elias Craig asked me to return. Uh, today's event is billed as a conversation, so I'll converse. <laughs> uh, starting with saying that I have a tangential relationship with the two panelists uh, to my right, which neither of them has uh, any reason to, uh, to suspect. <laughs> uh, they, they, uh, the, the relationships go back to a time more than 60 years ago uh, when I was on the faculty of Smith College. Uh, when I was appointed in 1949, I bought a house on Ward Avenue, uh, a few doors down from the home of Grace Coolidge, the former First Lady of the United States. I greatly admired her. She was a wonderful woman, um, uh, very much uh, more admirable than her husband. Who <laughs> <laughs> uh, treated her shabbily. Uh, he uh, demanded, gave her strict orders, that uh, she was never to drive a car, never to bob her hair, uh, and, and never to smoke in public, and above all, never to express any interest in any national issue to a reporter. <laughs> but she outwitted him. <laughs> she had taught at the renowned Institute for the Deaf in Northampton, and while strictly obeying his injunction, <laughs> Never to speak in public. <laughs> she addressed the luncheon of the press in sign language. <laughs> Much though I admired her, I never got to meet her, and I never even laid eyes on her. I was told when I arrived never to expect to see her in spring or summer because she would always be found in a box at Fenway Park. <laughs> but one memorable day, a uh, distinguished jurist, Charlie Wysanski, <laughs> came to Smith to lecture. And I was invited to a small reception for him. And to my great pleasure, 
I was seated next to Grace Coolidge. <laughs> so I've been grateful to the wise <laughs> <laughs> ever since. On another occasion, while I was uh, in Northampton, I saw a distinguished looking man seated on a porch. He was a Smith professor, I was told. S.A. Elliot, who I was informed had gone through all the hoops very properly on his way to establishing an academic career, and then at the very <coughs> moment he got tenure, he turned his back on all literary scholarship, despite his distinguished ancestry, and gave up the rest of his life to doing what he most cared about. This was all told me disapprovingly, but I thought it was marvelous. <laughs> and in the years since, as an avid birder, as my wife Jean Ann and I are, I have many times enjoyed dipping into the classic work that came out of Eliot's passion, Birds of the Connecticut Valley. <laughs> Pardon me? Co-authored. Co-authored. I, I was, uh, uh, you were, I think, talking about poetic license to me. <laughs> I, I thought I could drop the fact that he had a collaborator. <laughs> As a historian of the New Deal, too, I've been uh, indebted to the Elliott family, particularly because of uh, Tom Elliott's uh, marvelous uh, memoir of the origins of the Social Security Act and of Francis Perkins, which was mentioned uh, a few moments ago. A second. <coughs> uh, Social Security Department has uh, been with us for so long, going on 80 years now, that for a younger generation, it seems as though it's always been here, part of the landscape, but not so. When Frances Perkins became the first woman to hold a cabinet portfolio in 1933, it did not appear at all likely that the United States would soon have what other countries had long experienced since the age of Bismarck, old age pensions, unemployment compensation, and much more. And looking back at how the Social Security Act came to be, I'm struck by the importance of two groups. During the 30 years that I ran a PhD seminar at Columbia, I once co-sponsored a dissertation by Otis Graham that resulted in his book, Encore for Reform, which examines continuities and discontinuities between the progressives of the Theodore Roosevelt era and the New Dealers. Graham found that a good many other progressives were hostile to the New Deal. In particular, they didn't believe in powerful labor unions, and they disliked the welfare state. One group of progressives, though, did enthusiastically embrace the New Deal. Women. Frances Perkins and her New Deal associates carried on wholeheartedly the tradition of Jane Addams and of William Wall, of Hull House and of Henry Street. The other group that played an important part in putting the New Deal into action had one remarkable feature. They were astonishingly young. In the 1980s, I was keynoter at a conference in Princeton which was grounded on the idea of putting a historian in tandem with a practitioner from the period. As the speaker on Franklin D. Roosevelt that led off the day, I was paired with Wilbur Cohn, who <laughs> had been secretary of HEW. Wilbur, it was long said, uh, uh, had a, a special role in that if you were to identify who was an expert on Social Security? It was a man who had Wilbur Cohn's phone number. <laughs> At lunch that day, I asked him 
how old he was when he first came to work for the New Deal? The answer, 21. <laughs> One last tale. In the memoir about the first days of the New Deal and Social Security, a lawyer has recalled how awesome it was to take on such heavy responsibilities at such an early age. But he took comfort in finding that he could rely in the office on the wisdom of an older man. The older man was 30. <laughs> the author of that story, Tom Elliott. <laughs> I had five minutes. Uh, that seemed short, but now uh, President Pascarella appears to, in 90 seconds, get the <laughs> essence of what one wants to say. Uh, I'm going to have a hard time doing that, but I'll try to. Um, I'm no expert on Social Security. I can't promise you any um, <coughs> large insight, but I have spent the last uh, year or so since retiring on a book, as was mentioned, with relation to my father. And in that context, I have certainly come across uh, material that relate to Francis Perkins and to the Social Security Act, both of which, obviously, I owe a lot. First of all, I owe a lot because every month now I get a Social Security check. <laughs> but secondly, <laughs> secondly, and perhaps more importantly, Francis Perkins uh, was my father's boss, and in that connection, um, was uh, asked my father at a certain point to help um, look into the Im immigration laws and see whether there wouldn't be a way to allow more um, German Jews access to this country by immigration. And he devised, and this is all relatively recently understood in The Garden of the Beasts, a, a book that came out by Eric Larson not long ago, which uh, has caused a lot of people to ask me, was that your father? Well, it was my father who, thanks to Francis Perkins, um, created a bond uh, provision which allowed uh, wealthier Jews or Jewish organizations to put up the necessary wherewithal so that immigrant Jews from Germany and elsewhere could come to this country. And it wasn't too many years later, as a result of that, that my mother immigrated to this country and met my father, and so I'm here. <laughs> uh, so do I not owe a lot to Francis Perkins? <laughs> but, but frankly, um, uh, what I want to talk about, and it really is, is the texture of a relationship of a man who came to Washington at age 26, not 21, but age 26, as a uh, Solicitor of the Department of, as it then was, Solicitor of Labor. It was a, an appointment of the President, actually, because it was in the Attorney General's office initially, and only later, and I, I hope I'm not being, going to be corrected on this by the good professor, but I understand for a few months it was still in the Attorney General's office, and my father was uh, recommended on the basis of um, FDR, asking Felix Frankfurter for a bright, young graduate of Harvard Law School who would be um, a good person to help with labor issues. And my father, strangely enough, was at a law firm at that point where he had refused to write a memorandum in support of a um, position contrary to the Massachusetts version of the Norris LaGuardia Act, which was a pro-anti-labor um, uh, a pro-labor act, which um, was being challenged on constitutional grounds. So Felix Frankfurter, knowing my father to have been a very bright graduate of the law school and having clerked for a learned hand and Augustus hand and being 
very bright in that respect, was also pro-labor. So he went to Washington as an appointee of FDR. He had never met Francis Perkins um, until he came to Washington. And it was only one hour before he was summoned to the White House with Francis Perkins. Francis Perkins took him along to discuss what was to be the National Industrial Recovery Act. And he was asked, after a three-hour conference at which Henry Wallace, as Secretary of Agriculture, and Harold Ickes, as Secretary of the Interior, and many others of cabinet rank were present, FDR called my father over and said to him, this, this I get from his letters, I, I presume it's correct, because these were letters written home at the time to his mother, he, <laughs> he, he said to my father, um, you've heard the discussion now, I want on my desk by tomorrow morning a draft of the National Industrial Recovery Act. <laughs> you can imagine that nothing in his life thereafter, no matter what it was, <laughs> approached the feelings of inadequacy. That he had. <laughs> so then, um, uh, Francis Perkins and my father, it must be said, really at the outset, were not um, peas in a pod by any means. My father... Um, was not, despite having refused to, or declined to work on this memorandum challenging the Norris LaGuardia Act, he, w he really was not someone who was particularly um, political. He was trained at Harvard Law School, he clerked for two judges, who, renowned judges to be sure, but were in the cloistered chambers of, of the judiciary. And he came to Washington um, having, as he admitted to FDR, having voted for Hoover in 1932. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, having um, parents who were, um, or a father who was in business and whose family had voted Republican. And um, he really was not of the same uh, view necessarily as Francis Perkins. And Francis Perkins, on the other hand, as we know, her background significantly better, um, was certainly someone who came to Washington with an ideal, idealistic bent. And so the question really very quickly became whether my father was going to be able to work for this woman. And frankly, there's a letter to his mother in which he says that uh, he's frankly disappointed in uh, Francis Perkins. He's not impressed. Quote, a mess of contradictions and half-truths <laughs> is what he felt initially was what she put forth, which is pretty strong stuff. And uh, if it weren't in a letter to my grandmother, I, I, I wouldn't have believed it. But that, that's what he said. And the interesting thing is it was not very long at all before he began to understand that there were issues of great moment as to which he wanted to be part, which were idealistic and, and interested and effective. And the two of them became really dependent upon one another. My father, every day, first thing would be to talk to Francis Perkins, and she would talk to him about FDR, about whom she worked with, about labor leaders, about business executives. He edu she was his real world education, and he began to understand that she was doing work that he would be well a part of. And she, on the other hand, wrote to Felix Frankfurter a letter not more than six months after he began, in which he said, I, she said, I cannot tell you how relieved I am to have Wysansky at work. It is like having a really stout walking stick to lean on. <laughs> My father talked of her vigor, her vision, and her virtue, and something that he began to immediately or eventually understand. And I think the best way that I can really um, 
elucidate this is by the letter that she wrote to him when he said he wanted to go to the uh, Justice Department to argue the cases which he thought important as a lawyer and not so much involved in administration of a department. And this is the letter from Frances Perkins, and it, I have a copy of the first two pages of her letter. It's interesting because her handwriting, when contrasted <laughs> with my father's handwriting, and I have evidence of that too, and I'll put it on the table, you could not see two more different handwritings. These were very different people. Dear Mr. Wysanski, she writes on Blue Stationery and Blue Ink from the Brick House at River Road in Newcastle, Maine. And she writes it on August 5th, uh, 1935. And uh, as you'll see from the response, I'm going to read briefly, uh, it's received in Washington three days later and responded to. So that tells us something about the Postal Service then as it is compared to now. Dear Mr. Wysanski, <coughs> Mr. Wysanski, they've worked together for two and a half years. <laughs> I have tried to think and objectively about the suggestion that you might serve your country, the Solicitor General's office, practicing the delightful details of that ancient art, the law. <laughs> you, you see somewhat the, the difference, an orientation. I find it nearly impossible to be objective about the Labor Department, where my sense of responsibility is so deep that no other enterprise of government appears to approach its significance. She then goes on to detail in seven pages the challenges of uh, Social Security and the unwelcome, at that point, decision to have the board separate from the Labor Department and that it will be challenging both in the administrative and legal sides. And then, imploringly, I think, she says, puts it to my father, the question, won't this be an interesting life? And uh, goes on. What I'm trying to lead you to is the conclusion, first, that the department can't lose its gray matter just now, <laughs> and second, that I should find it very difficult, if not disastrous, to lose you as an advisor, thinker and counselor just now, this is underlined, and third, if your own judgment tell you that you must go, then of course I'll assent and be grateful for all that you have done. Three days later, my father writes back in his handwriting, as my mother called it, mosquito dust, so small <laughs> as compared to Francis Perkins' large and perhaps largely irrelevant, Ill illegible <laughs> scrawl. My dear Miss Perkins, your characteristically generous and gracious note of August 5th came yesterday. So it came August 7th, mailed August 5th. In many ways, it is one of the most difficult letters that I have ever tried to answer, for unlike the bulk of the perplexing problems we have in the last two and a half years considered together, your letter involves so many personal and emotional factors. I skip a bit. When I spoke to you last week, I had not expected you to be quite so surprised. For some time, in one way or another, I had attempted to suggest to you the possibility of my returning to the law and did not want to raise the point squarely so long as you were in the middle of a trying congressional session and so long as the fate of bills in which you were so interested was undecided. For the moment, you needed to concentrate all your thought upon these issues. Now this is of course August 8th and the Social Security Act was passed on the 14th. And the concentration, he says, was well repaid. To no one so much as to you do the American people owe the measures that are to be taken for their greater social and economic security. The President, some members of Congress and a number of persons in and out of the administration participated in the end product. But to you belongs the credit, which a just history will someday award for the driving power behind the fight. Beside this substantial accomplishment, everything else is dwarfed, and I think it is only because the fight has been so hard and so tiring that you can even for a moment regard as a serious defeat the setting up of the Social Security Board as an independent agency. This is a mere detail. What counts is that the President, 
the Congress and the country have in a few months adopted almost without change the bill you conceived, prepared, and sponsored. That is the crowning victory. Now, I, I, I could go on. I, I have a whole other chapter to talk about the Social Security Act argument, but I won't because I don't think I can. But Sam will have no time left. <laughs> so, no, no. So um, I do have here a picture of the court as it was, the nine justices, the swing justice, was Justice Roberts. Isn't that ironic? Owen <laughs> Roberts, not John Roberts. And um, the issue, which is so fascinating to anyone, I would think, and certainly to my father and to Professor Luckenberg, is whether my father's arguments in the Supreme Court made much difference, or whether it wasn't, as my father said, Mr. Zeitgeist, that is to say, <laughs> the temper of the times, what was going on outside the courtroom more than what was inside. Because after all, there was um, the 1936 landslide election, there was the court packing plan, and then there was my father, who gave what was, by all accounts, an excellent argument, no notes, he would cite cases by uh, um, volume and page, without looking at anything. He had great understanding of the history of the law and the economics of Social Security. And indeed, Justice Cardozo, who wrote the opinion, <coughs> um, in large part mirrors the argument, which was very unusual for him, that my father had made, and Justice Jackson, as he later was, at that time Robert Jackson, who was the Assistant Attorney General, they shared the two-hour argument uh, that at that point this made some difference for sure, but it was something perhaps larger. And <laughs> I, I, I've read up uh, uh, Professor Lorkenberg's, um some of his, what he has written, and uh, uh, there is this argument, if I'm not mistaken, <coughs> as to which he takes a position that it was the Times rather than the inter interstices of the law, the way that my father, in, in essence, argued precedent to expand the general welfare clause in a way that had never been expanded. And in the connection of the Wagner Labor Relations Act, which he argued before that, the question of the Commerce Clause, all of which is very familiar ground today with Obamacare. And there are so many ways in which I could draw parallels, it's rather frightening. Um, but I guess in conclusion what I'd say is we have to work on the zeitgeist in order to make sure that Social Security is preserved and Obamacare, if we, if we want to call it that, is enlarged and continues to help support us as a nation. grateful to be here to the Francis Perkins Center first and second to Nene and Charlie Wysansky. You can hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Because if their father had not invited my father to come to Washington in 1933 when he was 26, he would not have met my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and I would not be here. And, and later on, you can blame them. <laughs> I too would like to speak about Social Security, but I find myself easing into it with a true story that could have been tragic, but wasn't. My father was working for the government between 1933 and 1937, after which he ran successfully for a house in the uh, seat in the House of Representatives. And it was during his term there that he was upstairs one day, one night, 
uh, taking a bath, shall we say, or a shower. And my mother was downstairs and the phone rang. And if I could imitate her, I would, but I can't. So I'll just play it straight. My mother answered the phone and a woman's voice said, hello, Mrs. Elliot, this is Eleanor Roosevelt. Franklin and I would be so grateful if you and Tom would come next Tuesday for dinner at the White House. <laughs> and my mother said, Jeannie, that is the weakest imitation. <laughs> I've never, never heard such a bad job. You're really going to have to try harder, and I'm hanging up on your bank. <laughs> You may think it's funny. <laughs> she told this story on herself. Um, about 30 seconds later, the phone rang again. And the same voice said, no, dear, this really is <laughs> And at this point, my mother dropped the phone and ran up the stairs weeping. <laughs> saying, calling to my father, Tom, Tom, I have ruined your career. <laughs> <laughs> my parents were, anyway, she hadn't done, they had a nice time at dinner. Um, my parents were Unitarian. And as those of you who may be familiar with that denomination uh, know, Unitarians don't put much stock in saints <laughs> or sainthoods. But the household in which I grew up had three saints. And it's interesting to note that 66 and two-thirds percent of them were women. Frances Perkins, Eleanor Roosevelt, and her husband, what's his name? <laughs> My father published a book called When the People Mattered, and he took that phrase from Miss Perkins' 1946 biography of Franklin Roosevelt, in which she was describing his character and the aspects of that character that made him such a compelling candidate. And she said that it was very obvious from talking with him, that for him, the people mattered. And that's where my father got the phrase for his title. I didn't bring the book with me. I brought something better. I bought the unexpurgated manuscript <laughs> that Ken Galbraith didn't get his paws on. <laughs> what happened, sadly, was that my father died having finished the book literally two weeks before, and he was not to do, able to do the final edit himself, and that's why Ken is the editor and wrote the introduction. I've chosen just a few selections from a few pages that I think will illuminate my father's vision of what was happening with him, particularly between 1933 and 1935. Thanks to Charlie Wysansky. He's talking about his three jobs, the first two of which are important today. The third of those earliest assignments mentioned above was liaison with Congress. And by 1934, this was narrowed down for me into bill drafting, bill shepherding, and even lobbying. Under this heading, I suppose, comes much the most important job I did while at the Labor Department, perhaps the most significant job I ever did. This was the drafting, shepherding, and lobbying for a bill which, amended and improved, became the Social Security Act. At the end of 1933, few people were thinking about old age insurance. More, though not many to be sure, 
we're considering unemployment compensation or unemployment insurance. Even that was a pretty far, far out idea. I like that far out idea, yes. He survived the 60s. <laughs> I remember seeing a play, a campus comedy, in which rebellious students waving signs saying, we want unemployment insurance, drew a big laugh from the audience. However, the Democratic platform in 1932 had come out for unemployment insurance under state laws, and Ms. Perkins had made Roosevelt's promise to support implementation of that platform plank a condition of her acceptance of the secretaryship. Now he's talking about drafting the bill with Paul Rauschenbusch. The drafting of what became the Wagner-Lewis bill of 1934. And with only a few modifications, Title IX of the Social Security Act of 1935. I wrote home, the letters to mom are really important <laughs> with this history. I wrote home on January 21st, we got along very well. Rauschenbusch later wrote, he, Elliot, was a very able guy, a little insistent on his point of view now and then, but so was I. <laughs> After we talked it through enough, we managed to iron out most of the substantive problems involved in drafting with some compromises in each direction. We both knew that there was real urgency about completing our draft. And I will observe, as I remember all of my conversations about this with my father, and was rereading his book over the last few days in preparation for this gathering, that sense of urgency was 24-7. And it seemed to be shared by every player on the stage. This is when the committee voted to put everything together under one board. But, said a congressman, then it wouldn't be a social insurance board because grants and aid for help to the needy aren't insurance. Another congressman, I wish I could remember who it was, remarked, let's call it the social security board then. Everyone agreed. And then to make things consistent, they voted to change the last sentence of the bill, which read, this act may be cited as the Economic Security Act to this act may be cited as the Social Security Act. Mm -hmm. The House passed the bill in April after, oh, after Republican Representative Knudsen of Minnesota had said that it had been written by someone not yet dry behind the ear. <laughs> Which would have been my dad. <laughs> and then a couple of very personal ones. More than a month later, the House and Senate conferees finally agreed on a single version of the Social Security Bill. Both houses then passed it, and it was sent to the White House. There, on the hot evening of August 14, 1935, the President signed it, surrounded by, among others, Senator Wagner, Congressman Lewis, and Secretary Perkins. To the latter, he gave a copy of the bill inscribed with thanks to Tom Elliott from Franklin D. Roosevelt. That copy, that copy is on the table over here behind the, behind the cake. Here's the personal part. I was not present to receive it directly from him. I was at a party of young New Dealers, mostly on an outdoor terrace, also at the White House. There I danced with a demure and very proper young lady who astonished me by suddenly and without good cause, unless I was being insufferably smug, yanking my necktie. <laughs> exactly one year later, our engagement was announced. <laughs> and this is my closing. Now, before leaving the subject of my early Labor Department days, 
I must pause to say a brief word about the Secretary of Labor. I think she was a great woman. She was intelligent, committed to serving mankind, warm-hearted though tough enough to bear the scornful criticism of some newspapers and politicians. She was intensely loyal to her family, her subordinates, and her chief, the president. She was also a great talker, long-winded sometimes, but usually very entertaining, and could and did talk well about all manner of subjects. Only her own private life was off limits. The motto of her college class at Mount Holyoke was be ye steadfast. She was. Uh, one of the things that seems really interesting that you both have brought up is this very unusual quality she had of selecting very intelligent young people and giving them the free reign to do good work. Not only that, allowing them to do work, but helping advance their careers. In both of your father's cases, she made important introductions for them to the White House very quickly and let the president know how valuable their potential contributions would be. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things, and I think that's particularly appropriate right now when we're talking about an internship. We're really talking about what we need to do for the future in terms of mentoring young people, helping them to grow, and helping them to be able to take on some of the legacy of Francis Perkins themselves. Um, could you talk a little bit about how, at what age your fathers both went to work for Francis Perkins? Uh, I think I said, and it's true, in, in my father was 26 uh, when he went, came to Washington. And uh, it's certainly true that from the very beginning, um, Francis Perkins did lots of things to promote my father. And I, I, it's too easy, but I'm going to do it because I have so much material to quote from him. What better source? Um, this is kind of sad. What Frances Perkins taught me, I hardly realized until she was dead. Anyway, I sadly relate that I never told her what I owed her. When she took me in in 1933, I would far rather have gone to the office of the Solicitor General to argue cases in the Supreme Court, or even to the Department of State to handle any questions in international affairs. Fortunately, Miss Perkins allowed me to learn in action, in the place where the action is greatest and most critical and most unremitting, what democracy is all about. I saw the reality of the political theory about which I had studied. I was given the chance to frame some of the central parts of the New Deal, PWA, WPA, NLRB, and Social Security. I mediated strikes. Francis Perkins sent me in 1935 to the ILO in Switzerland to sit on the governing body. She caused me to serve for 15 years as a member of the Committee of Experts of the ILO. In 1941, she had me brought back to Washington by FDR to sit as a public member of the National Defense Mediation Board. In 1941, she no doubt led FDR to tell Congressman John W. McCormick that in selecting me as a United States District Judge, FDR was making a, quote, personal appointment. At every possible stage, Ms. Perkins brought me in direct contact with FDR, even to the extent of sending me to sit at least once in her seat at cabinet meetings and to lunch alone with him. Although I love A in hand, Augustus Hand, that was whom he clerked for first, and perhaps admire him more than Francis Perkins, and although no one I ever knew seems to me as great a hero as Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., and although of course I care far more for Gazella, that's my mother, and admire her far, far more than Frances Perkins. I put my debt to Frances Perkins for her example and for her generosity and nobility of spirit at the top of my accounting pages. Uh, one of the people I'd like to add here that I admire is Judge Wysanski's mother, Mrs. Wysanski. 
because when her son, 26 years old, went off to work in Washington, he'd gone to college in Boston, and he'd gone to law school in Boston, he'd never really been away from home. And she said he could take the job as long as he wrote back to her very frequently. <laughs> so one of the things that's really wonderful about the record of Frances Perkins' life is that many, many things survived and were noted by Charlie's letters to his mother. And it's a whole different version of history that otherwise we would never have. So thank you very much, Mrs. Wysanski. <laughs> and now, uh, your father, Tom Elliott, was also very young when he joined Francis Perkins, wasn't he? He graduated in 28 at the age of 21. So in 33, I can do that. He, he was 26 too, right? And I'm thinking, in addition to all of his obvious debt to her, there's another piece, uh, and it's one of the things that I treasure most about my father's brief political career. Understand, he was elected to the House um, it must have been in 1938, and in 19, sometime between that and 1940, he was gerrymandered. For any of you who don't know, the G in gerrymander is a hard G, you know? and, and he was very firm about that. And he was gerrymandered by no less a character than Boston's mayor, James Michael Curry. <laughs> Uh, who famously said of my father during one of his speeches, uh, my opponent, no, no, I have, I have more Christianity here in my little finger than my opponent has in his whole pink body. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because he was gerrymandered, my father lost a seat, and that was the conclusion of his brief electoral political career. But while he was in Congress, he was, I believe, the first freshman member of that august body to stand up and publicly, for the record, denounce the Dyess Committee, the HUAC. He called them out. And it made the newspapers, and it, of course, made the congressional record. And every time I read his words, I am overjoyed that that was my dad who took them on and really risked his career and his reputation in doing so. open up where we are running a little tight on time here, but I did want to open it up for a few questions, and someone, I'm sure, has a question for Professor Luchtenberg. Uh, anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, I understand that there was a move in Congress to impeach Francis Perkins. Could anybody talk about, a little bit about that, perhaps, the Professor? Okay. Yeah. Um, Yes, there was, a, there, was a, there was a very serious attempt to impeach Frances Perkins, and it had to do with the fact that she was generally seen as having been too welcoming to immigrants right. between 33 and 38. Um, and this was important at that time because the Immigration and Naturalization Department were part of the Labor Department, which you know, really does make a lot of sense because immigration issues really are labor issues, not really criminal justice issues. Um, and so um, she... Uh, had brought a lot of people to the United States. Uh, Charlie Wysanski had developed a charge bond program that brought a lot of people <coughs> to the United States. This was very controversial at the time because unemployment was so high. With a third of workers out of work, it was very hard for people to accept more people coming in. Uh, the particular reason that she got impeached, though, was because of her support or insistence on due process to be granted to Harry Bridges, a labor right, leader right, in yeah. San Francisco who was Australian by birth. And because of his labor activism, he was accused of being communist. 
and he, under the laws at that time, he was subject to being deported. The issue of deportation of foreigners was up before the Supreme Court at that time, so she insisted that they wait and see how the Supreme Court ruled. That delay was viewed as an impeachable action, and she was subject to a very serious impeachment attempt. This went on for about a year. Her reputation was ruined uh, by it, and they took the power over immigration and naturalization away from Francis Perkins in February 1939. Yes. So, and the fact is, you know, one of the little ironies is that um, Harry Bridges probably was a communist. <laughs> uh, she was not impeached. She, 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 she survived impeachment yeah. attempt, but she yeah. was not impeached, yeah. yes. And she survived in office and stayed with FDR down to the very last. He could never give her up. She really, he considered her key to the success of his administration. Um, I can't find it, but I, I'd just like to add a footnote. I think I might have gotten it from your book, Kristen, but um, <laughs> at one point um, in this impeachment proceeding, it was alleged that Frances Perkins was Jewish, and that her real name was some, I forget now, maybe you remember. M Matilda Watsky. Matilda Watsky, <laughs> exactly. Because there was someone married to a Paul Wilson whose name was Matilda Watsky. And uh, I think that this um, mirrors, of course, the fight, uh, the, the criticism of Obama, that you know he's not really an American. When these things happen, you know, when, when the, there is objection on the part of uh, certain people, the first thing they resort to is to say that the others are not of any account, they aren't one of us. <coughs> and that really was what was going on there. And I might also say, my father and I, and our family being Jewish, I think that was yet another thing that bonded my father to Frances Perkins. She said, if she were Jewish, she would be proud of that fact. Uh, just uh, uh, two comments on the excellent talk that we've heard from the other uh, panelists. On uh, uh, Mr. Elliot was telling that great story about Eleanor Roosevelt on the phone. Reminded me, I thought that. Uh, the background for this is I've worked with Ken Burns on his films for more than 30 years. And you might all want to know that next year, uh, PBS uh, will be showing for a, a great, great many nights uh, one of the films on which we've been working uh, uh, recently. It's The Roosevelt's. Uh, 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 Theodore Franklin and Eleanor. And in uh, when we were working on the Civil War, um, we all all the voices had to be introduced because there was no live footage. For the FDR era, we've got lots of footage, but it's still there are letters, diary entries that uh, require uh, a, a talk, an, an actor or actress to speak, and the person chosen for Eleanor Roosevelt's voice is absolutely magnificent. I never really knew Eleanor Roosevelt, but I was in her presence a number of times as a, a student political uh, act activist. And this person has her down the pauses, the high pitch, the intonations to perfection. Uh, as you might uh, 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 guess, Meryl Streep. <laughs> The, 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 the other uh, comment is uh, about the excellent talk from uh, Mr. Wysansky, who raised the, uh, the question of the zeitgeist. And was that what was decisive? Or uh, is it possible that his father's argument uh, might have had some, uh, had some influence? And I'm reminded of the story of a man who uh, inherited a badly weeded large lot and worked on it year after year until it became a beautiful flower garden. And when he finally got it to perfection, a minister came by and he said, this is a just magnificent garden. 
aren't you grateful for what God has given you? <laughs> and the man replied, you should have seen this place when God was doing it by himself. <laughs> the so-called Constitutional Revolution of 1937. It was a series of events court packing the 36th election, the CIO uh, sit-down strikes. But it also has to be remembered that when the New Deal cases were doing badly in the Supreme Court, one of the reasons is that they were so badly argued. And if one of the indications that uh, Charlie Wysanski's argument may have been telling is that those social security cases, unlike the Wagner Act cases, which were all five to four, were both five to four and seven to two. And so some thinking was going on on the part of some of the justices <laughs> that uh, accounted for that kind of calibration. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone.